All right, let's get going. So we've got a lot to cover today. Uh, we've been talking about quite a few things, um, and since the midterm is coming up on uh, Tuesday, uh, let's do a quick whirlwind recap of everything that we've uh, covered since the last midterm. Um, as same rules apply as before. If uh, I say something that's silly uh, or that you don't understand, raise your hand, yell at me, uh, make sure that I stop. Um, I will try and take uh, pauses for, for questions, but um, uh, the, the more the the more you give me feedback, the better, uh, the more effective I can be at communicating uh, the ideas to you. So uh, let's start off with uh, the very uh, the very first thing, or the the last thing that the previous midterm didn't cover, uh, which was the idea of optimization. Um, so. Uh, we talked about a couple of uh, different tricks that you could use for optimization. Uh, and the first of them was this idea that different relational algebra expressions uh, were equivalent. And in order to do that, uh, in order to uh, decide whether two relational algebra uh, expressions were equivalent, uh, we had a set of uh, baseline rules, uh, rules that uh, would allow us to take part of the expression uh, and replace it with uh, a different expression. So, for example, uh, you might have uh, a expression that looks, uh, that projects uh, D off of a selection of um, R dot A equals uh, 6 and R, uh, excuse me, S dot C equals 10. Um, let's define the schemas here. So I've got two. Uh, two different schemas, R1, let's call them R1, and uh, R1 uh, is uh, A and B, R2 is A and B, and um, S is going to be B, C, D. Uh, S dot C equals 10, um, and this is going to be sitting on top of a uh, union of two joins on uh, B of R1 and S, and a join also on B of R2 and S. Uh, OK, uh, what can we do to make this better? Um, well, one observation is that the selection predicate is happening very, very late in the process. Uh, so one common optimization, and we went over this uh, in, in various different forms, but one common optimization is to take the selection, uh, a, a selection operator and push it down as close to the data as possible so that you're filtering out uh, as much as possible. Um, so we had a couple of different equivalences that uh, we defined over the course of the class. Um, and one of those equivalences was that uh, the select a selection sitting on top of a union, uh, let's have some condition in there, selection sitting on top of a union uh, was equivalent of A and B, uh, was equivalent, let's make this a Greek letter, uh, was equivalent to uh, the same union, uh, but with that selection copied identically on uh, both uh, branches of the union. Uh, so in this particular uh, example, what we can do is uh, recognize that uh, there's a selection sitting on top of a union. Uh, we can always take that selection and push it into the union. Uh, so there are basically two kind of uh, children in that uh, expression. Uh, and there's the overall expression itself. And so we're going to take that uh, selection sitting on top of the union and push it down, uh, creating a equivalent uh, expression here. Uh, an equivalent expression um, 
Uh, by the way, if anything slides off uh, and I miss it, uh, please yell at me as well. Um, so the projection stays uh, completely unchanged, but now that uh, union is sitting on top of selection of r dot a equals 6 and s dot c equals 10. Um, similarly here, selection of r dot a equals 6 and uh, s dot c equals 10. And both of those are sitting on top of the joins exactly uh, that stay exactly as they were uh, beforehand. And just to emphasize the point, uh, this whole chunk and this whole chunk stay exactly the same. Uh, the only thing that has changed is that part with uh, the union uh, and the selection operators. Questions so far? OK, uh, so we can do the same thing uh, with the join now. We can take uh, those selection operators and we can push them down into uh, the joins. So I can take, uh, uh, I can uh, split this expression up into its individual uh, conjunctive clauses, uh, which is in effect a way of saying that I can split uh, a uh, selection predicate of um, one condition and another condition. Uh, that is uh, equivalent to a uh, selection predicate of one of those conditions sitting on top of a selection predicate uh, of the other condition. Uh, that lets us uh, split these selection predicates up into R A equals 6, S C equals 10, push them down into uh, either side of those uh, join expressions, uh, giving us, uh, again, projection of D sitting on top of union, sitting on top of the cross product, uh, sorry, the join on B of uh, selection on R A uh, over R1 and a selection over R, uh, sorry, S dot C um, sitting over S and then a mirror image of that on um, the other side of this expression. And once again, uh, for each of these uh, replacements, um, the only thing that was affected was this uh, chunk of the expression. That chunk of the expression got rewritten into a new chunk. Uh, that chunk of the expression got rewritten into a new chunk. And everything else um, under the cross product stayed the same. Questions so far? So I'm not going to go over the full list of uh, equivalence rules. Um, you won't be expected to memorize them, uh, but you will be expected to know how to, uh, how to use them in, in general. Um, questions on uh, equivalences, optimization in that respect? OK, so once you've defined, and this I'm going to use the board for, uh, once you've defined a, um, once you've defined uh, a way of determining whether two expressions are equivalent, uh, the next question is which of them is more efficient? Um, so in order to do that, we need uh, some statistics about the data and we need some tuning parameters. Uh, so I'm going to use uh, a couple of bits of notation. So uh, set, no uh, set size notation uh, is going to be used to define uh, the number of tuples. Um, I'm going to assume that there is a fixed number of tuples per page. Uh, there's a, obviously that's not always the case. Uh, the generalization is fairly straightforward, um, so I'm not going to be uh, too pedantic about that. Uh, but 
uh, going to assume that there's a fixed number of tuples per page. Um, I'm also going to uh, assume that for tree indexes, um, I have some number of tree index tuples per page, uh, and I'm going to use uh, T to denote that. Uh, and then finally, I'm going to use um, S to denote, uh, I'm going to use a uh, S to denote uh, selectivity, uh, which is going to be, uh, so a, uh, if I have a, a, a selection uh, predicate uh, phi, um, Uh, S is going to be uh, the ratio of uh, the number of tuples um, surviving the, uh, the filtering predicate to the number of tuples that you started with. Questions on the notation so far? OK. So uh, in terms of, um, in terms of uh, performance, we have three metrics that we care about. We care about uh, the uh, amount of, we care about the amount of memory. Uh, we care about the CPU cost, and we care about the IO cost. Now note, those are not necessarily going to be, um, the I.O. cost and the CPU cost are not necessarily going to be the same. All right, um, so let's start with, uh, let's start with a few uh, of the more straightforward cases. Um, I'm not gonna have enough space there, uh, so. Okay, so uh, oh, one other uh, one other uh, bit about uh, the data model uh, is that we're going to assume that uh, when we look at a relational algebra expression of some sort, um, every op we're going to measure uh, just to make our lives a little bit simpler. We're going to make sure that we measure the cost of each operator in terms of. Uh, assuming that its sources have already paid for uh, the cost of reading the data off of disk. In other words, we're gonna, going to assume that, uh, the, that each operator streams its output into the next uh, operator without going to disk. Uh, if an operator uh, can't hold everything in memory or uh, needs uh, more memory, it, uh, from the, the perspective of, of uh, its cost, we're going to assume that it has to write things to, to disk. So uh, for example, a, uh, so. Uh, okay, so uh, basic relational operator, how much memory do I need for this? Yep. Uh, size of R if I want to load the entire thing in, but since we're only responsible for streaming data output, uh, sorry, streaming data out from the operator, um, the amount of uh, memory that we need per operation 
uh, is just going to be constant. So we, we load one page in, we stream it out. We load the next page in, we stream it out. Uh, one page at a time. Uh, again, so the, the model is that every operator is responsible for loading everything in from, from disk uh, if it needs, but uh, it's then responsible for just sending uh, data immediately to the next operator. And if the next operator has uh, needs to buffer some of that data, it's up to the next operator to, uh, to account for that. Or to, um, if I have, for example, uh, R and then a join of R and S, uh, from, we're going to build up our cost based on these operators just needing to load things in from disk and stream them to some output. Uh, if we need to buffer, and if we're doing a join, we probably do want to buffer, uh, the cost for buffering it is going to be allocated to the join, not the, the relation itself. Does that make sense? OK. Any other questions? Okay, so in terms of memory, we don't need anything. In terms of CPU, well, we're loading things in. So uh, the cost in terms of CPU is going to be uh, the uh, however big R is. Now, uh, you'll note that uh, in terms of memory and CPU scaling, uh, we're using big O notation. Uh, for IO, we're going to use an exact number um, so the number of IOs that it takes to load in uh, a page, uh, sorry, to load in all of R is however many pages uh, it takes to store R. And uh, we're going to use P to denote the number of tuples that we can store per page. Uh, so if we can store P tuples per page, uh, and there are size of R tuples in R, then the total number of uh, tuples, uh, the total number of pa disk pages that we need to load in uh, is going to be size of R over P. Questions? Okay. Um, selection. Um, so selection uh, is what's called a one-pass operator. Uh, it doesn't need to buffer anything. Uh, as it uh, doesn't need to buffer anything. Uh, it still needs to visit every single uh, tuple in uh, the input. Uh, still needs to visit every single tuple in the input. Uh, but nice thing about it is that if you can stream the uh, stream data into the selection operator, the selection operator can just stream data out. Uh, so it doesn't actually require any IOs in general. Projection is uh, exactly identical. All right. Um, OK, so now let's get into uh, some of the interesting cases. Get into some of the interesting cases. OK, um, so we want to talk. Uh, so the majority of the cost is going to come in uh, from joins and aggregation. Um, but if we're going to talk about join operators, uh, we need to talk about which specific join operators we're interested in. So uh, the simplest of these is just nested loop join. Uh, which, how much memory does nested loop join require? R square. R square uh, what do you mean by? Uh, so um, nested loop join uh, requires the size of the output. Um, R times S. Okay. Um, why do you say that? Do you need to store any of that in memory? No. OK, so nested loop join uh, 
pretty much the only really good thing about it is that it doesn't require any memory whatsoever. Uh, what about CPU? Okay, so the CPU cost is going to be proportional to uh, the product of the sizes of the two relations. All right, now I.O. cost, this one's a little bit tricky uh, because there's a couple of ways of implementing it. Uh, the default way of expressing this is to uh, simply assume that you're going to need to buffer everything. Uh, so you read in uh, both relations as input and you save them to disk. So this requires uh, size of, be clear here, S. Uh, this requires uh, size of R, not, there go. Um, over P plus size of S over P. Um, so there's some cost for writing all of your inputs out to disk. Actually, excuse, excuse me. I'm wrong, you only need to write one side out because you can stream the other. Uh, okay, um, so once you're done uh, writing these out to disk, um, then you need to repeat it uh, every time you get another tuple from S, you basically loop over all of these tuples that are saved on disk, which essentially means uh, that in addition to writing everything out to disk, now you need to, uh, for every tuple of S, uh, you need to uh, join it against uh, everything For every tuple in S, you loop over the entire buffer once. This is ridiculously stupid, but this is how nested loop join works. Uh, of course, we can do better than that. Of course, we can do better that than that, which is where block nested loop comes in. So block nested loop join. Uh, we're going to buffer a little bit of each relation uh, a little bit at a time. And we're going to loop over entire blocks. Uh, now we need a little bit of notation uh, to uh, define the size of a block. So we're going to say that a uh, we're going to use the notation B to say uh, that, uh, so B is going to be the number uh, of uh, tuples per uh, buffer block. So uh, for block nested loop join, you need uh, to buffer a bunch of tuples from uh, S, and you need to buffer a bunch of tuples from uh, R, which means that you basically need, on the order of however big your buffer is, uh, memory. Uh, in terms of CPU cost, uh, the cost is effectively the same, although you now have uh, an additional little bit of overhead uh, from loading things uh, in from disk. But the CPU cost uh, still has the same uh, upper bound, which is uh, the product of the two sizes, since you're still joining every single tuple against every single other tuple. Uh, but now the I.O. cost has improved somewhat. Um, rather than this really gnarly uh, size of S, repeating the entire scan of the buffer for every tuple in S. Um, so you still have this, this cost to uh, save R. Uh, but now, rather than looping over the entirety of 
uh, that for every tuple of s, now you have to loop over uh, for every buffer block of s. Uh, so so for every buffer block of s, and if there are s tuples in, uh, sorry, if there are uh, size of s tuples in s, and uh, b tuples per buffer block, uh, the number of buffer blocks it takes to store s is size of s over b, um, and then for each of those buffer blocks, you're going to load in all of the, the, tuples of the, the tuples of your saved copy of R. Question so far, yeah. Sure. So this is the no, uh, IO cost is given in terms of number of pages. So if there are p tuples per page, then size of p uh, size of r over p is the number of pages in r. Does that answer your question? Any other questions? All right, moving on. Uh, we've got block nested loop. Uh, next on the list, uh, let's say uh, one pass hash join. Um, Uh, one pass hash, which uh, I have previously been referring to as grace or hybrid hash join. Um, uh, this has caused quite a bit of confusion, so from now on, I'm just going to be referring to it as the one pass or in memory, uh, the in memory hash join, um, the uh, one pass hash alg uh, algorithm. Uh, requires you to store the entirety of one relation in memory. So this is going to be, uh, this is going to require an amount of memory uh, proportional to the size of one of your two relations. Uh, in terms of CPU cost, now we've uh, gotten quite a bit better because rather than having to uh, rather than having to do a uh, to to see every single tuple in the relation. Um, sorry, you still have to see every tuple in the relation, but now you're just doing scans. Uh, you do one scan over R to build the hash table. And um, then once you're done building the hash table, the hash table is sitting in memory. So you can then uh, scan over the tuples of S. Uh, and for each tuple of S, you have um, Yeah. Uh, okay, so um, this is a little bit of a simplification. I'll, uh, I'll start with the simplified version. Uh, so for every tuple of S, you join it against uh, the hash table, and you're done. So uh, the, the overall cost is the cost to build the hash table, and then the cost to actually uh, read out of the hash table. Now this is a little bit of an oversimplification uh, because there's no guarantee that every tuple in S is going to join exa uh, against exactly one tuple in R. So instead what you can do uh, is use the uh, selectivity as a way of uh, gauging how many times you're going to need, uh, how many uh, tuples of R uh, you're going to match up against. So S in this case, so for every tuple in S, you're going to do a lookup on uh, the hash table uh, and then match that one tuple of S against a fixed number of, of tuples in R. Uh, and the number of tuples that you match uh, against is going to be essentially what you're doing is an equality, uh, an equality join. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, what you're doing is uh, filtering uh, things out based on their selectivity. And uh, the selectivity is the ratio of 
uh, the number of tuples that, uh, that match against the total number of tuples. So uh, every tuple in S is going to match up against uh, that um, essentially is going to match up against that many tuples, the uh, select uh, by, in this case, uh, where are we going to? So uh, essentially what I want to do is, uh, so for all, uh, I want to run uh, some query where I've got uh, essentially a constant value that I plug in in here. So in other words, what I'm looking for uh, is this uh, value, the, uh, the number of tuples that pass through that selection predicate. And uh, that's essentially going to be the selectivity, uh, which is equal to uh, the selectivity times uh, the size of R. It's just... Um, just uh, multiplying both sides of that expression by r. So uh, every tuple in S is going to join up against uh, the selectivity um, of the join condition. Question so far? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's the selectivity of the join condition. Uh, actually, you know what? Let's... Um, let's be a little more clear about that. So I'm going to use selectivity as just to... Okay, um, now what's the I.O. call? Yeah. Um, one pass. Uh, one pass uh, or in memory hash. One pass because you're only doing, you're only reading the, the data in once. Other questions? Doing on time, good. Okay, um, right. So IOs, well, wonderful thing here. It's all in memory, so you have uh, no IO cost whatsoever. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you need to read one tuple in. Fr um, so again, the the cost that we're going to attribute to this join operator is going to assume that the cost of reading the inputs has already been attributed to its children. So we're assuming that the children can stream in inputs uh, and whatever resources they need to do that. Um, have already been accounted for in the children. So in this, uh, if we're doing, uh, the, the reason that uh, we don't need to uh, attribute any IO cost to the one pass join is because we've already read in, uh, attributed the cost of reading in R to this operator. And we've already attributed the cost of reading in S to this operator. Does that answer your question? So. Uh, That's the uh, that's the cost of of reading in R. Yeah. So I mean, if we had, yeah. So just R itself would still have to read in the the tuples. Now, if we're doing a uh, in memory hash join, um, the hash join doesn't add any additional cost to that. Any other confusion? All right, good. 
Uh, okay, so the two-pass hash. Uh, so this is the one where you first bucketize all of your data, uh, spread it out on disk according to the buckets, and then um, and then uh, use your uh, use whichever other algorithm you want uh, on each bucket. Uh, so I'm gonna uh, right. So first we need to know. Uh, how many tuples are we going to put into a bucket? So um, let's say that we pick our hash function uh, so that on average we're expecting to see b tuples per buffer uh, per uh, bucket. So in order to do that, um, we can uh, generate the set of buckets uh, just by uh, streaming. So the memory requirement is going to be, uh, sorry, so the, the memory requirement is, is in, t uh, there, there are two phases th to the algorithm. Uh, the first phase where we're just uh, creating the buckets uh, doesn't actually require, uh, requires constant memory. Uh, the second phase, we're going to read in uh, one bucket of S and one bucket of R uh, and do a join on those. So uh, while uh, this is a little bit variable because we can't predict the size of a, of a bucket exactly, uh, we can still uh, approximate and say that in general, uh, the cost is going to be uh, on the order of B. The CPU cost, um, so we're streaming in R, writing it out to disk, streaming in S, writing it out to disk. So that's size of R plus size of S um, to build the buckets. And then reading them back in, uh, we're going to read in one bucket at a time um, and uh, join that one bucket. So, um, So there's going to be some in-memory co uh, CPU cost as well. Um, that in-memory CPU cost is, uh, depends on which algorithm we plug in uh, to do the in-memory portion of this. Uh, so for example, if we were doing a one-pass hash uh, for every uh, bucket, then uh, that would be the additional CPU overhead. Uh, right, and then in terms of I.O. costs, uh, in general, we're going to write everything out to disk into uh, their own buckets, and then we're going to read everything back in. Uh, one bucket at a time, granted, but once it's uh, coming back in, we never read a tuple out twice. Uh, so this is going to be, uh, in general, uh, so I need to write everything out. But then uh, I also need to read everything back in. So uh, buffer out. We need to write everything out and then buffer it back in. Questions? Yeah. Uh, CPU. Uh, so there's uh, the CPU cost is going to be the cost of writing th everything out to disk, uh, writing uh, reading everything back in from disk, and then um, we need to. Uh, we still, w once we've read in a, a, a bucket from S and the matching bucket from R, we still need to join the tuples that fell into those buckets. So we're going to have to, in addition to uh, the two-pass uh, uh, algorithm to, to put everything to disk and bring it back in, we still need to do an in-memory component. And uh, there are a number of in-memory components you could plug in there. Uh, this is just going to be the cost of whatever the in-memory component is. So if we plug in hash, uh, the one-pass hash into uh, that, we'll get um, size of R plus size of S, uh, times our times selectivity. Other questions? Did that address your question, by the way? 
All right, uh, do, 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 moving on. Uh, so we've got two other join algorithms. Um, move up a little. Oh, that doesn't even go further. Lame. Uh, all right, so we've got we've got sort merge join. Um, now, uh, from the perspective of the join, uh, we're going to Assume uh, we're going to assume that the data is already sorted if you're using a sort merge join. Um, the data might already be sorted depending on how we're reading it in from disk, or we may need to explicitly sort it. Uh, if we're going to explicitly sort it, we're going to put a uh, special. Uh, we're going to put a sort operator in the tree, and we're going to attribute the cost of sorting the data to that sort operator. So uh, from the uh, perspective of computing the cost of the sort merge join, uh, we're only going to look at the cost of the merge step. Now this is a very nice op uh, this is very nice because since you're you're reading in from two streams, but since they're sorted, you only ever need to look at the head of the streams to figure out uh, which side you uh, to figure out um, where, uh, to w what a uh, particular tuple could join against. So it uses constant memory. Uh, the performance is, uh, the CPU cost is just going to be linear because you never visit uh, a tuple more than twice. You just scan in the left hand side, simultaneously scan in the right hand side, and they're all arriving in uh, the right order for you to, to join them. So the cost, uh, very nice, uh, just scan over everything. Uh, and the uh, I.O. cost also ends up being uh, a big old zero uh, because um, it's a fully pipelined operation. Uh, if R is already sorted and S is already sorted, then we never need to buffer anything. We never need to write anything out to disk. Uh, the, entire th the merge component of the join can be done entirely in memory. Questions so far? All right. Um, last one. Um, index nested loop. Uh, so index nested loop doesn't actually require uh, any memory uh, modulo what the index requires. Uh, but assuming that the index doesn't require any memory, um, neither does uh, the, the amount of memory required for an index nested loop join is constant. Uh, but the index may introduce some additional overheads. Uh, the CPU cost. Uh, is going to, again, depend on the uh, index. So for every tuple of S, um, if, S if R is the, the, um, inner, uh, the inner tuple, or the inner loop, uh, interestingly enough, uh, the cost, uh, the CPU cost here is actually going to be uh, just dependent on the size of S and the size of the output. So same expression that was here. Uh, all we I'll make this bigger. So every tuple in S joins with some fixed set of tuples in R. Um, and uh, the size of R actually doesn't enter into this expression um, other than uh, in determining, in, uh, other than in terms of determining how many tuples S joins against, uh, the size of R doesn't actually uh, enter into the expression uh, because R is already indexed, which is, uh, which means that if S joins against exactly one tuple in R, then um, one tuple, uh, every tuple of S joins against exactly one tuple of R, then uh, the amount of work that we need to do is just proportional to the size of S. If every tuple in S joins against two tuples in R, then uh, we're doing two units of work. We're, do, uh, we're doing a lookup. We're, essentially, we, 
we're, we're doing a one-pass uh, join algorithm, but the index has already been built. So all of that, um, all of that additional overhead for uh, building the hash table has already been expended. The index is there. Of course, there may also be uh, costs associated with the index. Uh, so for example, if you're using a tree-based index, then um, you're going to have uh, a logarithmic lookup cost uh, for the first um, for every tuple of s. Uh, same thing holds for the I/O cost. Uh, this the I/O cost is going to be proportional to uh, uh, the size of s times the index. Uh, or not proportional to, but it's, it's going to be uh, the size of s times the index the uh, cost associated with the index. So uh, logarithmic uh, if you're using a tree-based index or um, linear if you're, uh, or uh, constant if you're using a hash-based index. Questions so far? Uh, logarithmic if you're using a tree-based index. So uh, where there's a tree, there's a log. Or where there's a log, there's a tree. Really right. um, but did, did that answer your question? All right. OK. Uh, how are we doing on time? Uh, okay. Not great, but I'll take it. All right, uh, two more operations that we care about um, are aggregation and sort. Let's actually start with sort. Um, So sort, um, if you do it entirely in memory, you can get, uh, well, it's going to be, so sort of R, um, you're going to need to store the entire thing in memory. Draw back. Uh, the cost, uh, well, best sort algorithms are n log n, so uh, size of R times log size of R. Uh, in terms of IOs, well, we're doing the entire thing in memory, so uh, no IOs. Of course, uh, that may not always be feasible, so we can also uh, reduce uh, things to uh, blocks. So if we build, uh, uh, we were referring to them as sorted runs, uh, or if we break R up into uh, blocks of size B, we're going to need uh, B memory at any given point in time. Uh, and then we're going to, uh, for every block, we're going to uh, read in uh, the entire, um, we're going to, uh, so recall the, the, the multi-pass uh, sort algorithm was that in the first pass, you create uh, sorted runs of size B. Uh, in the second pass, you merge uh, pairs of size B into uh, uh, longer sorted runs of size 2B. Uh, and, uh, and then you merge the, the 2B sized ones into 4B sized ones, uh, and so forth. So uh, this takes a logarithmic number of steps, uh, logarithmic uh, with a base of B, uh, so this is, oops, log, that one's a base two. Uh, so we need to go through a logarithmic number of phases uh, in the size of R. And for every phase, we need to read in all of R and then write all of R back out, uh, with the exception of the first phase. So that's going to be, uh, so, that whole thing. Um, so the first phase we get for free. 
because we're reading everything in and we don't have to write everything uh, out after the last phase. Uh, times uh, the um, for everything we have to read in all of R and then write everything back out. Uh, so logarithmic number of phases, and for every phase you read everything in and you read it back out, so it's twice uh, the cost of reading everything in or writing everything out. And the CPU cost is going to be uh, this whole shebang uh, times uh, the cost of sorting a block. So that's size, uh, that whole thing times B log to B. All right, moving on. Uh, questions on sort? Yeah. Oh, uh, for the last one is going to be, for the last one is going to be, uh, so this many phases, or sorry, log, So we're going to have to go through log b r this many phases, and then in each uh, in the first phase, uh, we are going to need to sort each block uh, b. That's going to be as uh, of uh, r over b times b log 2 of b um, cancels out. So you get the uh, size of r times log 2b for the first step, for the first phase. And then for every subsequent phase, Uh, you basically have to read in all of R and then write it back out. So that's uh, times size of R. Um, let's flip the order here. Size of R over B times B log to B. This whole thing plus this whole thing. Cost of the first phase uh, is the cost of sorting each individual buffer. Uh, cost of the second phase, uh, sorry, the cost of the second phase and subsequent phases is based on the size of R. Uh, and the number of phases that we need to do is uh, log base B of size of R. Uh, since we've already accounted for the cost of the first phase, this is the, the number uh, log base B of size of R minus one is the number of merge phases that we need to go through. Other questions? Aggregates. All right, as before, there is an in-memory version and there is a, uh, there are two on-disk versions. We talked about one of the on-disk versions in class. Um, so the in-memory version We don't need to store detailed information for every single uh, expression. We just need to store uh, 
a record for every group. Um, well, let's so a non-group by aggregate is just constant memory, a single pass read, and no IOs um, because you only need one value. You never need to page anything out to disk. You're good. Uh, for a group by aggregate, you need to uh, keep track of the number of groups, uh, the amount of CPU it's going to cost is uh, exactly the same if you're doing it in memory, and the number of IOs is once again zero because you're doing everything in memory. If you're doing it on disk, uh, so we talked about an approach that uh, uses uh, sorted, uh, sorted inputs in order to uh, make the aggregation process more efficient. So if you use, a, uh, if you use uh, the sorted process, uh, just like sort merge join, uh, all of the uh, all of the groups are already clustered together in the data uh, because it's sorted. So uh, the amount of memory that you need uh, actually drops down to be constant. You only need to keep one group in memory at a time. Uh, the amount of CPU cost is still uh, you're still streaming everything in. Uh, keep in mind this is uh, assuming that the data is already sorted. Uh, so if you want to use this in conjunction with uh, something on disk, then, or if you want to use this, the data had already, had better already be sorted, or uh, you had better put a sorted uh, operator in there uh, as well. But uh, group by aggregate, um, memory cost is constant, number of, uh, the amount of CPU work is also constant, uh, and because uh, your data is coming streaming in, the amount of uh, I.O. attributable to that specific operator is also uh, zero. Now, granted, if you're using the sorted aggregate, uh, you're probably also going to have to pay the cost of sorting your data. But that's, uh, that's going to be attributed to the sort operator. If your data is already sorted, you can save on that. Questions? Yeah. Uh, so this is, uh, so if your data is not sorted, then you need to keep every, uh, each of the groups in memory. If your data is sorted already, then um, the costs go down. One way to achieve an on-disk version of the aggregate would be to combine this with a sort operator. All right. Um, I know that was a lot of text. I will. Uh, I'll write that all up in a much nicer uh, format and and put it up tonight. But uh, so that's cost-based optimization in a nutshell. Um, any qu uh, further questions about optimization before I move on to transactions? Yeah. Uh, we are doing ER diagrams. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll open up the floor to questions. Um, due to the fact that I'm already at, uh, I've got about 20 minutes to cover transactions. Uh, if there are questions about ER diagrams, I'm happy to take them. Um, I was figuring. Uh, they, uh, you will need to know them, but I'm uh, kind of glossing over them today. Is that? Uh, but uh, again, if, uh, if there are questions uh, or specific questions, uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, right. So, uh, optimization, cost-based optimization, uh, ER diagrams, transactions. Okay, transactions. Um, oops. 
All right, so uh, transactions. Uh, okay, so we have been uh, talking about transactions in terms of uh, by looking at each transaction as essentially one big sequence of read operations, uh, sorry, write operations and uh, reads. And then eventually at the very end, either a commit. Oh, thank you. Uh, and then either a commit or an abort. Now, um, we were referring to this uh, to transactions in uh, the abstract in terms of locking arbitrary objects. Um, uh, but a object could be anything from the entire database uh, to a table, uh, to a row, uh, to a cell, uh, to potentially even a column, um, or uh, sometimes there's even uh, sets of uh, rows. Um, we talked about uh, ways of uh, getting these objects to interact, and, uh, most notably uh, the idea of hierarchical locking uh, or intent locking. Um, but for the most part, uh, we have been dealing with transactions in sort of an abstract. Once you define one of these objects as something that you can lock or that you can uh, protect, then um, that's pretty much the, the uh, that's done on a, a database by database decision. Uh, that is a database, or sorry, could be also, uh, or could also be a paid, uh, page, which is effectively a set of rows. Um, the decision of which object to use uh, is typically made on a database by database decision. Um, and the advantage of using more granular locking uh, or more fine-grained locking uh, is that more transactions can be allowed or more, uh, you get more interactions between transactions, uh, but the uh, penalty is that it's more expensive. And we talked about one way of, of dealing with that, namely uh, hierarchical locking. Uh, but uh, for the most part, what we're just concerned with is that a transaction can read from an object uh, and it can write to an object and we have some way of determining whether those two objects are equivalent. We also talked about a couple of different specific types of conflicts that could occur. Uh, so if two transactions tried to write to the same object, that is potentially a conflict, uh, a write-write conflict. Um, a transaction could try and write to an object that another transaction reads from, um, and this is known as a write-then-read uh, conflict. And then finally, uh, you could have a transaction that reads from an object, uh, then another transaction comes along and writes to that object, which means that the first uh, transaction's read is now out of date. So this is a read-write uh, conflict. Now, uh, conflict uh, doesn't necessarily mean a bad thing. It just means that those two transactions, uh, if two transactions conflict, uh, it means that that creates a uh, necessary sequencing between those two uh, transactions. So uh, if one, two transactions uh, write to the same object, uh, the second transaction uh, to, to perform the write, now uh, at least from the, the view of the outside world, is the transaction that came second. Now, uh, to make that notion a little more uh, crisp, a little more precise, uh, we defined a couple of uh, terms, uh, most notably uh, the idea of uh, serialize, uh, serial schedules.
So we noted, uh, we defined this idea of serial schedules, which is uh, a sequence of, uh, or schedules in general, uh, Uh, schedule a uh, sequence of reads and writes and we define this idea of a serial schedule which is that uh, you pick some arbitrary order over the transactions in the system and then you execute all of the transactions operations one at a time uh, transaction one then transaction two then transaction three um, or transaction two then three then one um, the precise order of the transactions doesn't matter uh, but the order of the operations uh, within the transaction does. Uh, you're, for a serial schedule, you're not allowed to interleave anything. Um, now, of course, serial schedules are not necessarily super efficient. Uh, you want to be able to allow multiple transactions to coexist in the database at the same time. Uh, so we defined what, uh, what a correct schedule was uh, in terms of a serial schedule. Uh, so a schedule is serializable in general if it produces identical output uh, to a serial schedule. Um, I am going to emphasize uh, a serial schedule because it doesn't matter which serial schedule uh, because again our notion of correctness is that the transactions uh, execute in isolation but we don't necessarily need to provide any guarantees about how the transactions themselves are ordered but um, the a, a schedule is serializable if it is uh, if it produces identical output to some serial schedule and this means uh, uh, output means both uh, the final state of the database uh, as well as the values that individual uh, transactions read out of the system. So every read we don't we have no clue what the transaction is doing with those reads, which means that we need to be able to, uh, we have no clue what the transaction is doing with those reads. Uh, so for a schedule to be serializable, we need to enforce that the, uh, the reads are all producing the same outputs and the, the final state of the database is also the same. Now, um, we don't actually know anything uh, in depth about the behavior of the transactions. Uh, it's entirely possible that a schedule might be serializable, um, but without actually knowing what the transactions are going to do, uh, we need to, uh, we, we don't have a way of necessarily in, um, detecting whether a schedule is uh, guaranteeing that a schedule, a particular schedule, is going to be serializable without being able to compare it to some serial schedule. Um, so we came up with a couple of uh, simplified forms of serializability um, uh, that we called conflict and view serializability um, that if something is conflict serializable, it is guaranteed to be serializable as well. And if something is, uh, how much time do I have? Oh, 10 minutes. Uh, if something is uh, conflict serializable, it's guaranteed to be serializable. And uh, view serialization was a generalization of conflict serializability. So uh, if you wanna do the Venn diagram, um, A schedule that is conflict serializable uh, is guaranteed to be view serializable. And uh, a view serializable schedule is guaranteed to be serializable in general. Uh, so I'm not telling you, uh, I'm not recapping just yet what each of these uh, definitions uh, is, but um, Conflict, uh, something that's uh, view serializable is 
uh, serializable. Something that's conflict serializable is both view serializable and serializable as well. Uh, so conflict Uh, conflict serializability uh, is the uh, any schedule is conflict serializable if it is conflict equivalent to some serial schedule, and uh, conflict equivalence is based on uh, the ordering of the conflicts in the schedule. So if I have two schedules A and B, A is conflict equivalent uh, if uh, all of the conflicts between A and B, and recall those were write-write, write-read, or read-write conflicts, uh, if all of the conflicts uh, are in the same order. Uh, so basically what that means is that if, if A and B have conflicts uh, and A's uh, conflicting operation comes before B's conflicting operation, that basically says uh, if uh, A, well, actually let's use T1, T2, uh, uh, T1 writes to A, uh, then T2 reads A, uh, then what that basically says is that T1 uh, must come before T2. Means that T1 has to come before T2. And uh, essentially what conflict serializability is, is saying, it builds this comes before graph, and if uh, there's a cycle in that graph, then it basically means that uh, I've created a sequence of events that couldn't have naturally occurred uh, if I was running things uh, with a serializable schedule. Uh, view serializability Uh, view serializability adds an additional uh, overhead to this, uh, or an additional uh, case. Um, it basically says that um, conf out of order conflicts are okay as long as their effects are hidden. Uh, Heisenberg's database, if you will. The, uh, as long as no one sees it, you're allowed to, uh, you're, you're allowed to uh, do things out of order. So T1 uh, does a write to A, uh, then T2 uh, does a write to, uh, sorry, T2 does a write to A, uh, then T3 does a write to A. Um, we're allowed to flip the order of T1 and T2's write to A because T3's write overwrites it. It's uh, both uh, T1 and T2 are, uh, are hidden from the outside world. Uh, so the only case where this uh, is uh, violated, is, or th this, uh, y where you're not allowed to swap, uh, is if uh, someone actually looks at it and uh, tries to perform a read. Okay, um, we don't have enough time. Oh, well, let me really, really, really fast uh, recap um, a few other high-level points. So specifically, uh, we talked about um, four different ways of implementing this. Uh, the first way was to uh, use locks. Uh, so locking essentially enforces conflict Uh, 
Uh, locking essentially enforces conflict serializability because um, because uh, it requires all uh, if there's a, a or sorry two phase locking. Uh, Two-phase locking enforces conflict serializability because uh, in order for the, uh, for uh, once a transaction is taken out a lock on an object until that transaction finishes and is no longer going to uh, perform any operations on new, a new set of objects, then uh, the, uh, uh, until that transaction is finished, uh, no other transaction can enter into a conflict with it. Uh, we also talked about optimistic concurrency control, uh, uh, specifically the uh, read, validate, uh, and then write uh, um, uh, formulation of optimistic concurrency control. Uh, same thing goes here. Uh, so depending on how you implement the validate phase, uh, this can be either uh, create a view serializability, basically the, the serializability guarantees um, uh, uh, we also talked about uh, timestamp concurrency control uh, and timestamp concurrency control is uh, uh, timestamp concurrency control where we mark every object with a timestamp and uh, read timestamp and a write timestamp. Uh, we use those to keep track of uh, of um, the ordering, uh, the relative ordering of operations. Uh, Timestamp concurrency control actually uh, uses uh, view serializability um, because if an operation is hidden, well, it's hidden. Um, you are allowed to have, uh, excuse me, you're allowed to have right after right conflicts that are out of order because if the transaction with the later timestamp comes in, um, uh, sorry, with an earlier timestamp comes in and tries to overwrite something done by a later uh, transaction, then um, then uh, that's perfectly okay. Um, the transact the the write just gets hidden uh, and completely hidden. Okay, um, and then we also talked about timestamp concurrency control with multi-version support. Um, and that uh, essentially allows uh, read after write. That breaks read, uh, sorry, write after uh, write before read conflicts uh, because we have a history of all of the, the previous versions. Um, Wait, die, wound, wait protocols are one thing I'm not going to have time to go over, but that's uh, something else uh, to, to prepare for Monday.